Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. All right. Explorer. Quest for Africa's Living Dinosaur is an award-winning documentary film that follows a team of scientists on a mission to find evidence of the elusive Mokeli Mbembe, a creature believed to be a living dinosaur in the Congo Basin. Alex Brecker is an international communication expert, writer, and documentary filmmaker. After graduating in communications and film studies in France, Alex embraced a career in international development, working with various international organizations in Central Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and the Pacific. He lived for three years in Cameroon, during which he shot two feature-length documentaries, Message in a Bottle and the aforementioned The Explorer, Quest for Africa's Living Dinosaur. Alex Brecker, welcome to Coast to Coast AM. How are you? Very good, Richard. Good morning, or good evening good. for you. <laughs> uh, it's also morning here now, very early, three, three, just after 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, Eastern Time. Uh, so, first of all, congratulations. It's a beautiful, a beautifully shot film. I mean, the scenery is absolutely stunning. Um, just describe where, when we talk about the Congo Basin, I mean, that's a vast area. Um, just kind of give us a sense of what the terrain is like and, and what part of Africa you were in. Absolutely. So, well, we're talking about the Congo Basin, which is a, a forest, a tropical rainforest that's about the size of Europe. Uh, it stretches from the, from the Atlantic coast in, uh, in Gabon to the mountains of the moon uh, in, uh, in Tanzania. So all across uh, Africa. And it's one of the last uh, wildernesses, unknown, uncharted areas in the world. Well, if you compare it to the Amazon, for example, uh, the Amazon has been widely explored, but the Congo Basin remains uh, uh, extremely mysterious. So the area in this very vast forest where we are looking for Mokelembembe is at the, at the border between uh, Cameroon and the Congo, uh, on the Cameroon side, uh, along the, a river called the Jar River. So, uh, Mokeli and Bembe um, will, will probably be familiar to many coast <clears throat> to coast AM listeners. We've, I mean, I've talked to Dr. William uh, Gibbons, who has been to the Cameroon and Congo uh, on several expeditions looking for this elusive creature. But now it has its own movie, um, Mokeli and Bembe. What do the locals? Uh, say it, it looks like? How, how do they describe this creature? Basically, they describe it as a, like a sauropod dinosaur. So the first testimonies uh, of Mokelembembe go back three or four hundred years ago. Uh, there was a French uh, bishop called uh, Abbey Proyard who was a missionary in that part of, uh, of Africa. And he started collecting uh, testimonies from the locals uh, who described that giant uh, claw-footed uh, animal that yeah really looked like a like a sauropod dinosaur? So people have said it looks like an apatosaurus. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the different, uh, if you collect different testimonies, but uh, well, there's no clear description of the animal. Just a global shape. Maybe it has a horn. Maybe not. But uh, every uh, local tribes person would agree to say that it's huge. And that's why they have called it Mokelembembe, which means one who can stop the flow of rivers. So it tells a lot about the size of that animal. And you mentioned a pod, an apatosaurus. I think that's what we used to call a brontosaurus, um, which, yeah, I mean, absolutely immense. Um, and um, the film is titled The Explorer. So while it is about the search from O'Kelly and Bembe, it's really focused on 
um, Michel Ballot, this former uh, lawyer from France who left everything behind to to uh, to go to Africa to 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 find this creature. Tell us tell us some more about Michel Ballot. So Michel was a, was a lawyer in the south of France, and about fifteen to twenty years ago, uh, he started writing letters to Bernard Hovelman. So for those who know about cryptozoology, Bernard Hovelman is a is a Belgian uh, scientist, and he is considered the father of cryptozoology. So he's He's very well known for his investigations on uh, Loch Ness Monster and Yeti and, uh, and Bigfoot. Uh, obviously, he was also uh, uh, involved. He examined the body of the Minnesota Iceman, uh, which was very famous, a very famous case in the U.S. So Michel started exchanging letters with uh, Bernard Hovelman, and uh, he asked him, like, bluntly, where in the world am I, would I be likely to find a cryptid? And Hovelman said, well, you should look at the Congo Basin because there you have an animal called Mokelembembe. And, uh, well, we, we have lots of testimonies. There's some evidence. And there's, it's likely that there's something out there. So Michel went on a first journey to uh, Cameroon and the Congo. Uh, he spoke to the locals. The locals confirmed that there was something big living in that forest, and then he went a second time, found new evidence, then three times, four times. He dropped his job, um, and now he is a full-time explorer, so he dedicates his life to the search for Mokelembembe. He has been in about more than 20, 25 expeditions. Uh, he was writing me recently that he's planning uh, for another expedition that will take place in, uh, in October, so he goes there two, three times a year. And, well, he finds new evidence uh, each time he goes there. And, uh, well, I'm quite sure that he will find something one day. I mean, there's too many proofs that the beast exists. And Michel is certainly the most advanced researcher, specialist of uh, Mokelembembe. So you were living in in the the Cameroon for about three years. Uh, Were you doing um, sort of NGO-type development work there at that time? Yes, I was working. Uh, so I started, uh, I was working with WWF, the conservation organization, and then I, I, I worked with the UN, the United Nations. Okay. So during that time, you, you met Michel Ballot. What were the circumstances uh, under which you met Michel Ballot? And then maybe you can describe what your, that first meeting with this explorer was like. Absolutely. Um, so uh, basically, uh, Michel uh, got a bit of a reputation in France, uh, got well known in France, because he wrote a book called Searching for uh, Mokel Mbembe. And I read that book, and it was absolutely amazing. So at the time, I was working with uh, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, in Cameroon. And, uh, and I read that book, and well, I found the research absolutely amazing and fascinating. And he was describing areas which I used to know uh, when we were, for example, um, tracking elephants or gorillas. So he was looking for Mokelembembe in the same area. And the funny thing is that uh, I met some uh, pygmy tribes people when I was working there, and they would talk about Mokelembembe at night, you know, at the fire camp. Uh, So when I read that book, it really resonated. And I was like, okay, I need to meet that person because I'm, certainly we have lots in, uh, lots in common. So I sent him an email. Uh, I told him, like, well, uh, I'd love to join one of your expeditions one day if you would invite me. And he told me, I'm going in three weeks. Come along. And then I went with him on the first expedition. And um, were you filming at that point or was this simply a kind of a – um, an introduction to the to the terrain and so forth, or or did you start filming right away? No, no, no. The first expedition was really to uh, to go there to discover. I mean, to learn more about this quest for Mokel and Bembe, to uh, to meet uh, Michel, uh, to look at the terrain, and uh, and to be really honest, I didn't believe much in uh, in Mokel and Bembe at the time. If you know that part of Africa. Uh, well, people would, would describe lots of uh, myths or monsters. They talk about, for example, mermaids, the Mamiwatas 
in the in the in the large rivers of of Africa, and we know this is certainly not. Correct. I mean, they're not creators of uh, of uh, flesh and blood. So for me, Mokelembembe was maybe more of a myth. Now we went on that expedition. We so when you go on an expedition from even from Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon, is not a, it's not an easy journey. So you have to to drive basically for uh, for three days on dirt roads. It's uh, it's very long. Then you take a dugout and you and you and you go uh, on the on the on the river on the Jar River. You go upstream for for another three days. Uh, you have mosquitoes, you have flies, you have lots of insects. So it's it's quite an adventure. And then you reach this uh, uh, absolutely wonderful Enki waterfalls, uh, which is the the which are basically the doors to the area where Mokelembebe is supposed to live. Um, so I went on that expedition just to see the nature, to, to, to discover a new place of the Congo Basin. But the thing is, we found something. We found some new evidence during that first expedition. And yeah, then I, I started believing that maybe something, uh, something exists out there. I, we, obviously, we want pe- people to watch the movie and we don't want to give everything away. But can you give us a hint as to what that first little bit of evidence was that you discovered that led you perhaps to believe in the reality of Mokeli and Bembe? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, well, and it's very funny because uh, you mentioned um, Dr. Uh, William Gibbons, Bill Gibbons, uh, yeah. earlier in the show. And going, going back to 2012, uh, Bill Gibbons was with Michelle in uh, that part of the Jar River, and they were uh, setting camp, and they heard a big roar uh, that really crossed the forest. And, well, the local people said, well, this is certainly Mokelembembe, but it was very far, and then, then it stopped. But they came back, you know, no recording, nothing happened. And when I went back uh, there on the so in my first expedition, which was in uh, the winter of 2015, uh, one night we were also set around the fire camp and we were starting to eat, and we heard a huge <clears throat> roar and then a big splash, something that really crossed the forest. I mean, really something loud, and the splash was even louder. And we interrogated local people, and they said, well, maybe these are elephants, maybe gorillas that we're not really sure, or maybe, to put it simply, it's Mokelembembe. There, that place is known for Mokelembembe, and, you know, you know, it was the middle of the night, we're in the middle of nothing, in the middle of the forest, so you tend to, to believe in what uh, local people say. So the day after, we took the dugout, and we went upstream, to try to find the area from where the roar was coming from. And uh, we saw some large footprints. They were a bit hard to read, but it was something very large, like uh, 80 centimeters and 55, so, 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 something, so something quite big. Um, and, and that was it. And the locals confirmed, like, yeah, I mean, that's Mokel and Bembe. So this is what happened during the first expedition. And the funny thing is that we recorded a bit of the of the sounds. Um, I sent it to Bill Gibbons, and he told me it's exactly the same kind of sound that we heard back in 2012 during our expedition. So this is what happened. And when I came back from that expedition, uh, well, I had more questions than answers, obviously, but, uh, but the way people talk about Mokelembembe, what you can find in terms of evidence, well, I, I tend to believe that it's absolutely real. So that first expedition that you accompanied uh, Michel Ballot was 2015. When did you actually start filming uh, for the documentary The Explorer? So that was a couple of years after that. So in, uh, in 2017. So uh, in 2017, so what we talk about the winter in, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere is the, is the dry season in, uh, in Cameroon. So basically, if you want to go on an expedition there, you can go from there's a window from October, uh, October uh, November to March. Then it's the rainy season, and it's uh, you, you really can't go. I mean, the, the river, the flow of the river is too strong. So in um, September uh, 20, uh, 20, yeah, 2017, uh, 2016, sorry, Michel uh, reaches out and he tells me, well, one of my trackers 
has found a, a cave uh, that is said to be the den of Mokelembembe. So it's very far. Not only we have to drive for these three days and then take the dugout for three days and then uh, climb the NK waterfalls and, uh, and walk, uh, but we have to walk for about 10 days in the forest to reach an absolutely uh, remote uh, area that's in a totally pristine forest, so no human civilization, nothing. It's complete wilderness out there, very dangerous as well, but we might possibly find uh, the den of the animal and obviously some, uh, some hard evidence, you know, that, uh, that Moked exists. So do you want to come? <laughs> I told him, yes, of course, but I would like to do a movie, to film a, a documentary on the research. Uh, I mean, to share that with the world, that it's too amazing, you know. So, so he told me, okay, no problem. I told him I will bring a camera. I will certainly hire a, a pygmy a tracker to help me with the sound. You know, we, we want to, to be as light as possible, but we wanted to, to shoot a professional movie as well. But we're just a two people strong uh, team. And we try to be absolutely invisible. So people wouldn't see us. We would just follow the expedition and follow Michel. And so that, you know, we wouldn't be intrusive with the cameras. And, uh, and, and it worked pretty well. And the 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 locals there, the pygmies, um, when they talk about Mokele and Bembe, they've seen it, they've encountered it. Are they frightened by it? Do they hunt it? So they are frightened uh, by Mokele and Bembe. Um, if you look at the area, when you so there, there's there's a village called Endongo. And Endongo is about uh, one uh, five hours uh, boat ride from the port where you drop the car, basically. And you, so you, so you, you take the boat, you go upstream for uh, for five hours to reach that village of Endongo, and this is the last village. Then, if you go upstream, so two three days towards the Enki waterfalls, you won't find a local on the river. You won't find a village, and even fishermen. Uh, stay in the in the um, area of Endongo, and they don't go further uh, upstream because they're afraid of Mokelembembe. And it's absolutely amazing. I mean, there are fishermen, there's plenty of fish out there, but they don't go there because they're afraid uh, of the beast. And if you look how... back at the... Yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. And if you look back at the history of Mokelembembe, so in another place, uh, area of the uh, Congo Basin, uh, called Lake Tele. Um, and that was certainly in the 70s or 80s. Uh, so Lake Tele is another high, uh, well, um, hotspot for uh, Mokelembembe sightings. It's a, it's a lake, it's a crater lake that was certainly uh, created by, by, um, by a meteorite that fell down on that forest. And, uh, and it's, it's another very remote area and lots of, uh, there, there, there has been lots of sightings happening uh, over there. And back in the 70s or 80s, there's apparently some, a couple of Mokelembembe were terrorizing uh, local fishermen. So they couldn't put the boats uh, on the lake to go fishing. So the villagers, local villagers, decided to kill these Mokelembembe. So uh, th 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 there were some canals uh, leading to the, to, the, to the lake, and they started creating traps uh, to try to trap the animal, to attract the animal in these narrow uh, water streams, and then to kill them. So they managed, apparently, to kill one with spears and arrows, uh, and then they ate the meat, and the, most of the villagers died because the meat was certainly poisoned. And it's a story that has been told uh, uh, across the Congo Basin. It is said to be true. And, uh, and, you know, poisonous meat, uh, animal that can attack the boats, because that's also what they say. Uh, so they're, they're terrified about Mokel and Bembe. Okay. Um, I, I can't imagine the challenges that would, uh, would be presented to a filmmaker, uh, you know, being in this vast wilderness. Um, maybe you can talk about some of those. I mean, you... I know you travel fairly light as a filmmaker, and obviously now the technology is pretty small and compact. But I mean, how do you keep how do you keep the equipment dry, and how do you keep uh, I don't know. Uh, you tell me what are some of the other challenges of, of filming in the in the Congo Basin? So, uh, well, it's extremely extremely complicated. Um, 
the first problem is the problem of batteries because there is obviously no electricity. So for that film, um, we're filming for about three weeks um, and I had eight batteries. Uh, so it's not a lot. And I had a small solar panel that would allow me to charge uh, one battery per day when the conditions would allow. So, you know, when you shoot a documentary, you have to uh, produce lots of, uh, lots of footage. You have to film a lot to really be able to capture the right moments. But with only eight batteries, you have to think before shooting, uh, which is not what documentary filmmakers like to do. So that was a, a kind of a technical challenge, but... Well, we're quite fortunate that uh, it went on very well. And the coolest things, the, the most interesting things of the expedition happened while I was filming. So, so, so I was very fortunate to that extent. The other issue, the second issue, is a physical challenge. So imagine you're in a super wild area. Um, you have lots of every possible animal uh, on Earth that trying to kill you. So you have snakes, you have uh, mosquitoes, you have, uh, say, say uh, fly, flies, you know, that, that are worse than mosquitoes. I mean, mos mosquitoes are the worst, the, the least of your problems, sorry. And you're constantly harassed by these insects. Um, and you have to film. And you know, when you, when you film, you have to, to, to find the right angle. So I have to, for example, uh, run in the forest to be ahead of the expedition, to see them uh, walking towards you, um, so, so it's physically really exhausting. During the filming, I lost about five to six kgs. I, I came back, I was very skinny. My wife told me, Where, what the hell have you been doing? So, so that's, a, that's a big, big challenge. And then, well, you know, the, the overall challenge when you shoot a movie about cryptozoology is to find uh, producers. So we found... A, a great producer in France, but we, we had really limited means, um, which means, well, we, we, for example, we didn't have materials to, to protect uh, our equipment from humidity. That's what the, the question you ask, um, uh, because it costs a lot of money. Uh, and there's, in the Congo Basin, there's a humidity rate of above 90%. So basically, we took uh, plastic bags and, uh, and, and we, we, we try to protect uh, the equipment that way. But basically, my, uh, my camera didn't survive the expedition. <laughs> but it was fine. I mean, it broke on the very last day when we're coming back to, to Yaoundé. So that's, uh, that's fine. It never worked after that. <laughs> and what about the danger? You mentioned mosquitoes and so forth and snakes. But, I mean, you're, you're sleeping maybe not under the stars at night, but you're sleeping in a thin nylon tent, just, a, you know, separating you from... All of these, well, what kind of encounters with wildlife did you have? I mean, were you ever, did you ever feel like you were in danger? Uh, basically, all the time. Uh, it's an extremely, extremely dangerous place. So I mentioned insects, um, spiders, mosquitoes, tsetse flies, and snakes. Uh, we're mostly afraid of snakes. You have uh, three types of snakes in that forest. So you have the green mamba, which, uh, which, lives in the trees, so it can uh, bite you in the neck. You have the black mamba, which is a, a territorial snake, uh, and it's on the ground, and basically it would defend its territory, so he would attack you on purpose and try to kill you on purpose. And both, they can kill a human being in about, well, one to two hours if not, you're not treated properly. And there's another snake that I never, um, I was never able to identify that the locals call the snake 321. So basically, it bites you, three, two, one, and you're dead. Um, Lovely. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 quite, it's quite amazing. I, I really don't know when the, and lots of other explorers have heard about that snake, but without being able to identify it. Um, so at the beginning, you're afraid. Uh, you look at the trees, you look at the ground, you look at the insects, you look at everything. And then after two, three days, you know, you start being a bit more relaxed and categorizing the animals be that you encounter between what can kill you and what won't kill you. So, for example, uh, one night I was sleeping in my tent, and it's indeed a very thin island tent uh, that's protecting you from the wilderness. And my tent was very small, and I'm quite tall. 
So at some point during the night, I, I was not sleeping well. I wanted to stretch, uh, to stretch. And when I stretched, my, my foot touched something, a living creature just uh, outside of my tent um, across an island. And I felt something cold moving near to my tent. So I opened the door of my tent and it was a giant python of maybe five to six meters long. Uh, and I was like, well, this thing won't kill me. So it's four in the morning. Tomorrow we have a long day of walking. I just pulled my tent and went back to sleep. You know, that's, that's the kind of uh, state of mind that you're in. Very nonchalant, even though you were just inches away from a killer python. Um, what about, uh, there are gorillas there as well. Um, any fear of gorillas, you know, ripping yeah, your so tent in? Of- yeah, in terms of megafauna, what we call megafauna, you have elephants and gorillas. So gorillas are extremely impressive. And even in that area, there are uh, completely wild gorillas. You know, so in some parts of Africa, you have a habituated group of gorillas who are used to human presence. But there, there's no human presence. So they're absolutely wild and they can be very aggressive. But if you see a gorilla, so the silverback, the, the male, will come towards you first to protect his family and will start to, will try to impress you. So he will, will scream, like, you know, and, uh, and show his teeth. The teeth of a gorilla are really impressive and, and try to scare you off. If you run, you're dead. The gorilla will catch you and will kill you. If you put your eyes down and even knee on the floor to show the gorilla that you're on his territory, he will let you go. It's, a, it's all a, a domination game. So gorillas can be very frightening, but they're not the most dangerous of these large animals. Elephants and the species, the subspecies that you can find in the Congo Basin, they are called forest elephants. They're a bit smaller, just a bit smaller than the savanna elephants, but they're much more aggressive. Uh, they are being hunted relentlessly because their ivory uh, is what people call pink ivory. It's a bit more precious than regular ivory, so they're being hunted. And they're aggressive. And if an elephant wants to uh, start running after you, he will run after you until he kills you. So you better run faster or try to hide. They have bad eyesight, so you can, if you run fast enough, you know, you, 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 you well, you can save your life but they will do everything they can to kill you. Any close calls with either gorillas or the forest elephants? Yes, of course. And uh, we, we, we saw a gorilla, but from, from really far during the expedition during which we shot the movie, we saw more during the first uh, expedition. And, uh, and yeah, the elephant. So if you watch the movie, um, we, at some point, we were in a forest clearing and, uh, and we saw a beautiful forest elephant uh, that was bathing in mud. Uh, so we stayed there, I started filming and everything. So, and at some point the elephant turned towards us and started working, walking, uh, really slowly and then faster and faster and then went after us. So I just like grabbed the camera and we all ran away and we managed to escape with, uh, with no damage, hop- uh, hopefully, but that was really close. And, uh, can you share an instance where you thought you might be getting close to, uh, capturing a Mokeli and Bembe on film, footprints or more noises or a splash in the water. Well, I really don't want to spoil the movie, but uh, but well, so we went on that expedition. It lasted for about uh, one month in total, so three weeks of filming, and uh, during the first two and a half weeks. Uh, the journey was amazing. We heard lots of locals. We recorded testimonies, and uh, uh, it was great. Then we went uh, into the forest, into the, in a completely unknown area above the Enki waterfalls. Um, we got lost in the forest. <laughs> so, so, so if you see the movie, well, everything was captured. Um, and then we managed to, to go out of the forest after leaving so many adventures. And uh, it was great. And I knew I had a good film uh, on tape, but no good evidence of Mokele Mbembe's presence. And when we were walking down from the forest, 
uh, crossing the Jar River, we found an island that we called Dinosaur Island because of what we found over there. And it was one of the culminating points of Michel Ballot's career as an explorer because we found some evidence on that island that can possibly prove the world that Mokelembebe exists. But once again, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, everything is the, is the movie, and, the, and I know some of your listeners will, will watch it, so I don't want to spoil it, but I'd be very happy to discuss more uh, with people who, who have seen the movie of how this can change perception of uh, cryptozoology and, and what lives in the Congo Basin. So for, um, when you say that Michel Ballot, I think you said he's, he's been on, was it 25 expeditions? Yes, more Looking or less. Looking for Something this, uh, this, a creature this conspicuous, um, you must get this question and he must get this question all the time. How is it that a creature this big that has been seen by so many of the the the, uh, the locals there, the pygmies. How is it that it's eluded uh, him for so long? Well, uh, there have been there has been so many expeditions. Some people have heard roars. Some people some people claim to have seen it. I don't know if you recall in the in the early eighties there were some uh, some large American expeditions. One was led by uh, Dr. Roy McCall. Uh, from the University of Chicago, and he worked with a local um, guide, Felicien Agnania from Congo. They went to Lake Tele. They say they have seen the animal. They have filmed it, but uh, but the camera didn't work. So lots of people claim they have seen it, including the local people. And, you know, I mean, they see Mokel Mbembe, I would say, on a weekly basis. That's what they say. When... so. Imagine the size of the area, the size of Europe. Uh, the forest is extremely thick, so you can walk three meters away from an elephant. You won't see the elephant because there are, these animals are silent. The forest is thick, so they're very hard to spot. You don't see many animals. It's not like you see an elephant every five minutes, but there are plenty of elephants and there are plenty of gorillas. But, you know, if you see one elephant during a whole expedition, you're, you're happy. Um, and scientists say that to have a breeding population of an animal, of a species like Mokel and Bebe, you need a thousand uh, animals. And considering the vastness of the area, well, having a thousand animals is, is, a, is a firm possibility. It's so huge. It's so dense. It's so unexplored uh, that, that, well, it's a possibility. Uh, and, you know, when you go on an expedition, well, you put like game cameras, you know, which are this, uh, these cameras that uh, the trigger when an animal passes in front. Um, but technology is still limited. Uh, it's one expedition, a con of uh, 10, 15 people in the forest uh, going there, looking around. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, your chances, the odds that you find something or that you have a visual encounter with a Mokelem Bebe are very thin. But once again, if we continue the research, and we will continue, and I hope my movie will help uh, raise funds to continue the research, we, well, I'm persuaded that we will find something because there are too many evidence, too many witnesses uh, for something, something new, not to be found, and that would be the greatest zoological discovery since, uh, since maybe a century. Uh, if if the local pygmies are or um, have on occasion hunted this creature, um, one would hope that they you know they would keep the bones. Um, are there any any pygmies who claim that they they have bones or they have some sort of physical remains of this creature? Yes. Yeah, so well, um, I think Bill Gibbons and uh, and Rory Nugent, uh, who wrote a while ago a book called uh, "Drums Along the Congo," which is a, which is an excellent book on the search for Mokelembebe as well. They claim they have seen bones of a known animals that belong to uh, pygmy uh, tribes, but basically, they uh, the only case of a Mokelembebe being hunted is. The, the story I was mentioning earlier of uh, local pygmy tribes killing a Mokelembembe on the shores of Lake Tele. And that's it. Right. They don't hunt, hunt the animal. They're afraid. I mean, the animal is said to be big. It's said to attack the dugout and to kill the people. Uh, so so they, 
they're not hunting these animals. They're hunting smaller game to eat, and they don't keep the bones. And the other question that rises quite often is why don't we find bones as skeletons of, uh, of Mokelembembe? The Explorer, and how can we screen it? It's now available on Vimeo, I understand. Yes, absolutely. So it's available on Vimeo. So vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Explorer film. So vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Explorer film. And we release it at a very low price. And uh, basically all the revenues that are generated from the film will be used to found our next expedition. We have a, we have a plan for a very ambitious expedition still on the Jar River. Uh, and uh, and we hope to, to, to make a bit of money out of the release of the film and to be able to go back there and obviously to shoot a second movie. Sounds like you've caught the bug. Um, I mean, you, I, you never set out to be a filmmaker that makes movies just about, uh, you know, cryptozoology, but now it's it seems like you may have caught the, the same bug that Michel Ballot caught. That's a great question. Maybe, maybe I did get back. Um, but, you know, we're so close of making a fundamental discovery. Um, I really believe that Mokadip Mbembe exists. I really believe that if we go back there at some point, we will find it. Um, there's so much evidence. Uh, and really, you know, finding a, one of the great cryptids uh, would be a, an amazing, uh, more than an amazing discovery. It would send the word, the message, that there are still unknown places of Earth and that these unknown places, they still hide mysteries and some amazing mysteries uh, can still be solved, you know. I strongly believe that the age of exploration is not dead, that the people have just lost interest. So, you know, being an explorer, going there and trying to prove the world that, uh, that some, some mysteries uh, are still there would be, uh, it's an amazing thing to do. So the movie is, is, um, is called The Explorer. So let me ask you, is it about Michel Ballot and his quest, or is it about the, the creature itself, Mokeli Mbembe, or is it 50-50? It's about 50-50. It's about 50-50. So, you know, um, cryptozoology documentaries, they all sometimes, I mean, most of them, they follow the um, same structure. Um, they're real documentaries formatted for TV and, uh, um, and, you know, and sometimes you hope that you will see some revelations and uh, uh, that some secrets will be revealed. But Generally, you know, I mean, from the ones I've, I've seen, you're always a bit disappointed at the end. Um, what I wanted to do with the Explorer is to do is to shoot a real movie, uh, and we were lucky enough to be to be quite successful and be selected for, uh, by many uh, great film festivals, uh, mostly in the U.S. but also elsewhere in, in Europe and Asia, uh, because it's a real movie. It's something that people who are not interested in cryptozoology can enjoy as well. But obviously, you know, as a passionate, passionate filmmaker and, uh, and cryptozoologist, it also includes lots of information uh, uh, about Mokel and Bembe and, and the quest. So I would say, yes, 50-50. It's about a search of a man that is uh, sure that he can uh, unveil uh, one of the greatest mysteries in Africa, and it's about the mystery himself. So what is Michel Ballot's idea if, if he actually finds one of these creatures and, you know, you capture it on, on video, but is he interested in capturing one? Uh, would he consider, I don't know, uh, tranquilizing one so that it could be, um, I don't know, you could, you could have fixed some sort of a, a, a radio tracking device to it. What does he want to do with it if he, if he finds one? So the, the answer is, uh, is twofold. First of all, uh, I think when you choose to dedicate your life to chasing a cryptid, uh, well, it can be challenging. Uh, your loved, loved ones are supporting you, but up to a certain point, 
and even your professional uh, relationship, you know, uh, uh, you when you start to embark on such an adventure, you know, you lose friends, basically, and you, you make so many sacrifices. So I think that Michel wants to find Mokembebe to prove that he was right, you know, when you dedicate 20 years of your life to searching an animal. Uh, well, you really want to find it uh, just to accomplish your destiny. So that's his personal quest. Uh, now, capturing a Mokelembembe, um I mean, taking picture or video recording uh, of a Mokelembembe would also help uh, protect that part of the world. So the Congo Basin is the victim of, uh, of poachers. You have lots of poachers. You have deforestation. Uh, forest elephants are being killed. And if you bring back proof that there's a dinosaur, a giant lizard that lives in the area, well, you're more likely to protect the area and maybe to build some sustainable tourism around the presence of that animal. And it would basically save the, uh, the Congo Basin. And that's the other dream of Michel. Um, uh, he's, he's a passionate conservationist as well. He loved the area. I mean, we all do. And uh, he, he, he would like to protect it. Does, what, what are Michel Bello's um, feelings on, on, or thoughts on what this creature might be? I mean, the, the, the idea that this could be a holdover from, you know, that major extinction event that wiped out dinosaurs 65 million years ago, does he think it could be a survivor from that, an actual Apatosaurus? Or does he think it's a, a creature we simply, we haven't, uh, you know, categorized or cataloged it yet? So he thinks, he thinks, and we 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 will do that. Uh, it is certainly a creature that hasn't uh, been uh, catalogued yet. That it's just an unknown animal, and it maybe not a dinosaur that has survived from the Cretaceous or or prehistoric times. Now we are surrounded by dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are everywhere in the world. Look at sharks, crocodiles. Uh, or silicon, that fish that they discovered uh, 40 or 50 years ago in the Comoros. So these are dinosaurs. This, these are living fossils. These are creatures that haven't uh, evolved since uh, since the ancient times. So we all think, including Michel, that Mokelembebe could be a large reptile that hasn't evolved much, but certainly not a dinosaur. Um, has anyone, any of the locals, the, the pygmies, have they ever witnessed a Mokeli and Bembe fighting uh, a forest elephant or a hippopotamus or any other creatures? Yes, back in the Congo, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, um, local uh, people said about a big fight that occurred between um, a Mokeli and Bembe and a giant uh, snake. Um, and we, we got some testimonies as well uh, of uh, Mokelembembe uh, uh, fighting elephants, uh, and that's in uh, in Cameroon and also in uh, and also in the Congo, uh, attacking elephants and keeping the tusks. So this is quite strange, but well, lots of researchers think that Mokelembembe could kill elephants. Uh, and keep the tusks to create a, a kind of not a nest or a or you know a, to protect their territory or um, yeah so that's that's what local uh, people uh, say. Now there is another cryptid in the area that's a bit less known. It's called uh, Emele Antuka, uh, and Emele Antuka means the elephant killer. And well, some cryptozoologists cryptozoologists think it could be a triceratops. Um, and it's a large animal that, with a horn that is uh, targeting elephants specifically. So big question, is Mokelembembe and Melantuka the same? Are we talking about two different cryptids? Well, on that, we, we really don't know. Is there competition among these explorers like Michel Ballot and, and uh, well, I know he and, and Dr. Bill Gibbons are friends, but is there a level of competition amongst them? Because there are more than just those two that are searching for this creature, uh, sort of, you know, a competition to see who will be the first. 
to, to spot one and to record it? No, I think I think that everyone's helping each other. Um, the competition took place in the uh, early 80s in the U.S. Uh, you had like two uh, prominent explorers, uh, Dr. Roy McCall and Rory Dungeons, who both mounted uh, their uh, their expeditions uh, in the to Lake Tele in the Congo uh, with lots of means, financial means. So they wanted to bring proof, and there was a kind of competition. Uh, Mokelembebe was high in the news at the time. Uh, Disney uh, issued a movie called Baby, the Secret of the Lost Legend. Uh, on Mokelembembe, so 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 at the time it was really in the spotlight. Now uh, interest has vanished a little bit, and all the explorers, uh, Michel Ballot, Bill Gibbons, and the other serious people looking for Mokelembembe, we are all helping each other. So sharing intel, uh, sharing some equipment sometimes, and going together uh, whenever we have the opportunity to to do so. Uh, I've been discussing with Bill Gibbons, uh, I think it, a couple of weeks ago, and we are thinking of uh, of, uh, of going together on an expedition along with Michel, uh, and certainly in the swamps of uh, North Gabon, which are very promising uh, places where uh, we can find something. Now, you mentioned Bill Gibbons. He's a creation scientist. He Does he still believe that Mukeli Mbembe is a holdover from the... Uh, you know, the, the the mass extinction event that killed the dinosaurs off 65 million year, years ago, that somehow several of them survived and continued to breed? Well, that's you need to ask him. Uh, now, in the conversations I, I had with Bill, uh, he's, he's also very pragmatic. Uh, he's using a scientific approach uh, to find Mokere Mbembe. And we all do. Also, we respect local cultures and beliefs, and we listen to local people because they have a lot uh, to tell us that we are using uh, scientific methods to find Mokel Mbebe. So I think that Bill's take is first to find strong evidence uh, and to find Mokel Mbebe and then, well, you know, uh, to, to, to assess what kind of animal it is. But once again, uh, you look at crocodiles, you look at sharks, you know, there are leftovers from, <laughs> from, from the ancient times. So, so, you know, everything is possible. What about drones? Are you, are you employing drones, Alex? Yes, we do. We do. Uh, so both regular drones and underwater drones as well. But it's very challenging because uh, of, the, uh, of the batteries. Um, so, you know, you burn a drone battery uh, normally for a normal use in the northern hemisphere, for example, in the, what well, it last. 25 minutes to half an hour in the Congo Basin because of humidity. You know, it's, uh, uh, well, you have five minutes of flight time, so it's it's very short, and you need to be very lucky to, to spot a Mokel Mbembe. We did use drones. We didn't find much, but once again, within the five minutes time range, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit complicated. We also used underwater drones, uh, but the water is so dark, so brown, that it's very difficult. Now, there's a Monster Quest expedition that went to the same area um, five or six years ago, and they used sonars, uh, and it was quite promising. Um, they, they found la- large sonar uh, prints of, of a large animal, and that's the next uh, objective that we want to do. We want to go back there to kayak down the Ja River so that we would be completely silent with sonars on the kayak and well, maybe we, we, we could find something. You also, you won some awards at some film festivals. Absolutely. So, so the film had a very successful festival career in the U.S. So we won a first award, Best Documentary, in San Francisco uh, at a great festival called uh, Another Hole in the Heads. Um, and it was quite unexpected. Um, and then we won the Best uh, do- uh, Documentary Feature uh, Award at the Midwest Weird Fest with our very good friend Dean Bertram, who's a great supporter of the film. And, and then I think in total we won nine or ten awards for uh, 17 or 18 selections. So, so it had a great festival run, and now we're really ex- excited to, to release it to the public. It's such a beautiful film. I mean, it's just, it's breathtaking, in fact, as, you know, and that, and the, and the, the Congo Basin is, uh, breathtaking. Uh, 
it just it deserves to be seen on on a big big screen is there any plans uh for like a theatrical release so it has been screened in uh, in theaters in uh, in different festivals uh but really you know the goal for this film uh of this film is to make uh, the the quest for Mokel and Bembe searched uh, the quest for Mokel and Bembe story known to to wider audiences. So that's why we we chose online release. We have followers all across the world in Europe, in the U.S., uh, even in Africa, a lot. You know, so we really wanted to make it uh, as widely accessible as possible. But it has indeed been, been screened uh, on uh, in theaters, um, and I'm doing some uh, some conferences and public talks quite often uh, across uh, across Europe and so with movie screenings and, and then talks, which are quite successful. Why don't you think a, a, an organization like the National Geographic would be interested in this story? So they, they are interested in, the, in, in, in Mokel and Bembe. Uh, there has been a great um, um, National Geographic uh, documentary um, on the Congo Basin, and they talk about uh, Mokel and Bembe. Now, you know, cryptozoology is always a delicate topic to uh, deal with for mainstream media like National Geographic. Um, it's at the limit of science and paranormal studies, which are not always considered noble uh, science. I do consider that cryptozoology is, well, is a science like any other sciences, but, you know, some mainstream media, some mainstream film producers say, well, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit obscure, it's the paranormal, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more genre uh, uh, kind of film. It was either the lowland gorilla or the mountain gorilla, I don't think was actually uh, verified until something like, I don't know, 1913. So prior to that, uh, the, either the lowland or the mountain gorilla was sort of in the same boat as Mokeli and Bembe, right? Just a kind of this legendary mythical creature, uh, probably mainstream science didn't necessarily even believe it existed. Exactly, Richard. Uh, you know, before, uh, before the, 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 the early uh, 20th century, Local people in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, at the, at the border between Congo, uh, actually, and, and Rwanda, were talking about large, hairy men, human beings, uh, that lived in the mountains. And, you know, some people would say, Yeti, Bigfoot. But no, they were real craters called, uh, 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 well, mountain gorillas, uh, and they discovered them. So because of a cryptozoological approach, we discovered a new species of animals. Same goes with the okapi, which is a very strange animal uh, from uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's uh, it's kind of a balance between the zebra and the giraffe. Um, and you know, local people would talk about that uh, okapi, and no one would believe them. But at some point, they did find that animal, uh, which exists. So, really. For me, cryptozoology is is a science like any other science. We must uh, listen to local people. And if we follow a scientific approach, which is what we do when we look for Mokel and Bembe, well, you know, we might find something in the end. Uh, are there similarities, do you think, between Mokeli and Bembe and the Loch Ness Monster? Could it be the same type of creature? Or do you think they're two separate uh, species. So, witnesses of the Loch Ness monster would describe more a plesiosaurus, which is another subspecies of dinosaurs. Uh, Mokel and Bembe would be a more of an apatosaurus or a, a kind of large sauropod brontosaurus dinosaur. Um, they both uh, live uh, most of their life in the water. But there are very few sightings of Mo uh, Loch Ness monster on land, uh, whereas there, there has been lots of sighting of Mokel and Bembe uh, on land. So, so I think if we are talk talking about two different species. Now, for the Loch Ness monster, there has been lots of sightings, and obviously it's very um, uh, big in the news. Now, really thinking that we need about a thousand individuals to have a breeding population. Uh, lots of 
scientists think that uh, the Loch Ness Monster is more of a myth because you wouldn't have enough nutrients in the lake, in the loch, uh, to feed a population of a thousand large animals. The Congo Basin is much bigger, and obviously you have all the nutrients you need. So, so well, that's what scientists, including Michel Ballot, including <clears throat> some other scientists who are uh, keen in finding more mo- mo- think about the Loch Ness Monster. Speaking of Bello, Bello Michel Ballot, the explorer, uh, do his friends, family, do they think he's crazy? <laughs> his wife is from Cameroon. And ah. his wife supports him totally because in Cameroon, well, you know, Mokelembebe is a real animal. It's not like, wow, amazing, Mokelembebe, dinosaur, like our perception here. Well, when you go there, when you meet people of the forest, pygmies or bantus, you know, they say, yeah, in the forest we have elephants, we have gorillas, and we have Mokelembebe, and that's it. You know, it's totally normal. So for his wife, he's normal. Um, for the cryptological community, he is one of the most expert scientists and researchers of Mokelembebe. Now, I'm sure there are people who think uh, he is crazy. Um, I don't know for him. I know for me, you know, when I went on my first expedition, um, I so I told my wife, look, I'm going for three and a half weeks in the forest. I will have no cell phone, nothing. Uh, but really, I'll come back and then we'll see. We'll see what happens. And the, my wife's uncle called my wife and told her, like, sorry, I have something to tell you. Your husband is cheating on you. And she what? said, why? Because, well, going in the forest for three weeks to look for a living dinosaur, I mean, that's one of the craziest stories I've heard. He is cheating on you. He's going to see his girlfriend. Wow. And <laughs> obviously it was not the case, but, you know, it sounds bizarre. It sounds strange. But then when you start looking at the research and at the methods and the approach, well, it's a, it's a totally serious and rational approach. How does Balo live, though? If he's, I mean, he had a, I would, I would think, a pretty lucrative career as a lawyer in France, and he left that all behind. So now, how? I mean, how does he survive? Well, his wife uh, works and has a quite good and successful career, and Michel Balo uh, founds his expedition uh, through uh, sponsorship. So he had uh, he had sponsors behind behind him. He writes books. Uh, now he just wrote a, a second book and he sells his book and uh, and yeah people support his quest he has an association um and uh, and he receives uh, grants uh for the research so so he does he's not a rich person but he's living the dream which is absolutely priceless priceless while you were with him um on the, the first expedition in 2015, and then when you were filming with him and you were there for about three and a half weeks, did he ever confide in you that he's getting discouraged because he hasn't found Mukeli and Bembe? Yes, many times. But the question I kept asking him is, do we really want to find Mukeli and Bembe in the end? Um, you know, when you're in such a search, when you find the animal, then this quest is over. And I think he's as excited to find Mokelembembe as afraid to end the quest. Now, a question I asked myself when I went with him and I started filming the movie is that, okay, if I see, if we see Mokelembembe, if we spot the animal, do I film the animal or do I film the face of Michel Ballot? And well, I came to the conclusion that I would do both. You know, I would take a pic of Mokelembembe and then quickly shift to Michel Ballot and film his face. Because when you have a man dedicating all his life, you know, losing friends, making so many sacrifices to find a gigantic animal and that he finally sees it, well, what happens on, in his eyes might be something absolutely amazing. Um, the other, we were talking about how dangerous it, it is over there. You've got the wildlife, you've got, you know, mosquitoes, uh, and so forth. There's also a, is there not still a civil war raging in Cameroon? Well, there are several conflicts in, uh, in Cameroon. You have, uh, you, well, uh, yeah, 
yes, the, the, there's a civil war, but it, it's in the, the western parts uh, of Cameroon. Uh, there, there is a rebellion of the Anglophone region, regions um, uh, versus the French regions. In the north, you have uh, terrorism, and, uh, and you have the, the war in, uh, in Central African Republic that spills over in Cameroon with, uh, with about 250,000 refugees. So it's a, uh, it's a quiet... Uh, well, you have to, to, to be aware of that, of conflicts. Uh, now the area that uh, we are exploring is, uh, well, is absolutely empty. There's no humans. So the most dangerous humans that you can come across are poachers. Uh, right. And poachers, they have war weapons. They, they're out there for the elephants. And they won't hesitate to kill you if you're on the way. So, so we're always a bit afraid of poachers. Hopefully, we never met any. We were close to a camp of poachers and we heard gunshots. It's in the movie. Uh, we, we also saw a dead elephant. Uh, and, well, we, we went away quite fast. And, uh, and that's the closest we've been to poachers. Alex, uh, how, how again do we watch uh, the movie The Explorer? So the Explorer is available on Vimeo, so vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Explorer film. Vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Explorer film. Alex, great speaking with you again. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful film. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Richard. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.